Um, so welcome if this is your first time um, attending our support group. This is where you can get lots of information about having bariatric surgery. If you've already met our team and you're waiting for surgery, it's a good way just to touch base and still feel that you're very much part of the fold. As you all know, there are long delays for meeting our team and having surgery. So we appreciate that um, it can be a long path and we hope that you find it sessions really helpful and um, so this evening we're very lucky we've got our bariatric physician he's very integral part of our multidisciplinary team um, most people will meet one of our bariatric physicians we're very lucky we have three at Salford um, and it makes up part of the consultation when you first come to meet the team at Salford and um, so without too much ado we will pass on to Dr Medalia. Hi, very good afternoon. Good evening, rather than afternoon now. I'm Dr. Raj Chikram with the one of the bariatric physician and endocrine consultant at Salford Hospital. So, just a minute. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so, I'm, as I said, I'm Raj Mudliar, one of the uh, bariatric uh, physician and a consultant endocrinologist at Salford Hospital. And hopefully, most of you will see me or one of my colleagues when you come to tier four bariatric clinic, surgery clinic at Salford Hospital with regards to surgery planning. So I'm going to talk about metabolic syndrome. I know it is a very dry topic, uh, a lot of medical knowledge in, in, involved inside, but I think most of the people would have heard about this uh, syndrome, but I, I think we should start with a basic definition of what is metabolism. So as you would know, metabolism is a, a very intricate chemical activity going on inside the body, which converts the food which we eat to the energy so that the body can work. So, as you would know that there are various hormones, uh, enzymes involved in this process and chemical pro in this chemical process, and uh, it provides energy to the body all the time because body needs energy while it is uh, awake and working and while at sleeping, sleeping as well. So to maintain this uh, intricate balance, there are two important processes which happens in the body. One is called as anabolism, another is called as catabolism. Uh, it's quite medical terminology, but I would try to explain it in more um, layman language, basically. Anabolism is basically um, where the body builds up the tissue and it stores the energy. And catabolism is just the opposite of that, where body try to uh, uh, be a destructive activity to bring out the energy for use. So what happens is basically when we eat, it is stored in the body with, help, with the help of various uh, hormones and enzymes. And when we need energy, body breaks it down. So this process uh, uh, of uh, breaking down depends upon uh, our activity level and our basal metabolism. So basal metabolism is something which is basically burning the energy while at rest. So various, various factors are involved and some are non-modifiable mo factors like um, your genetic makeup, uh, your certain health conditions, but overall, it is more defined by how the body constitution is. If somebody's got significant amount of muscle weight and less of fat weight, they will have a higher basal metabolic rate. So there are various factors which can help decide how the person would be able to burn the calories, uh, which goes in the calories, as you would know, is the measure of what uh, the food, what uh, when we eat provides the energy to the body. So in terms of uh, understanding the metabolism uh, it is uh, in a summary a pathway which helps to give you energy so having understood the metabolic uh, metabolism now we can understand what metabolic syndrome would be so there are various definition to define metabolic syndrome but the one which is adapted is from uh, Inter international diabetes forum which basically includes waist circumference or the abdominal obesity um, especially for men if it's more than 94 centimeter and for female it is more than 80, 80, 80 centimeters so this criteria along with two of the following criteria which are based namely the high blood pressure which is more than 130 over 85 millimeter of mercury or impaired um, fasting glucose um, more than 5.6 or glucose resistance i would i would say in in other uh, terms and similarly like the bad cholesterol, which is high cholesterol, high triglyceride levels of more than 1.7 millimole per liter, and the good cholesterol being low at, um, uh, which is basically what we call as HDL cholesterol, less than 1.4 millimole in 
males and less than 1.2 million was in female. So the waist circumference and two of this criteria, uh, if somebody has got this, then they, uh, then they have what we call as a metabolic syndrome. Uh, there are other um, uh, definitions as well, but generally most um, uh, parameters which are used for defining such condition is from this group of five uh, criteria, which I mentioned now. So, in a nutshell, metabolic syndrome is basically a presence of cluster of uh, risk factor which predisposes to the cardiovascular diseases, um, and these are namely the risk of getting di uh, the, the namely because uh, there are diabetes, uh, heart heart diseases, stroke, and heart attacks type of thing. So, when we say metabolic syndrome, um, we have to understand uh, how we can. Uh, manage this and what we can do about this. So uh, the further slide, further down in the slide talk, I will talk more about how we manage this condition, how we recognize this condition. So what causes metabolic syndrome? Um, at present, we don't have a clear understanding, but there are many reasons which could be involved, many pathways which could be involved, but primarily it looks like insulin resistant remains the central point of um, uh, uh, the process of causing this issue. So as you would see, metabolic syndrome, um, uh, as per the uh, slide which I have put it from um, uh, for your reference, it, it the insulin resistance can cause different uh, uh, changes to your metabolic pathway by causing different uh, um, involvement of uh, various uh, organ system in the body, including cardiovascular system and, um, and digestive pathways. So who is at the risk of metabolic syndrome? Uh, I would say like generally it's, it could be everybody, one of us could be having this. Um, it is generally mostly related to the age and the central obesity and the other factors which are uh, uh, like uh, ethnicity, uh, personal family history of diabetes, smoking, alcohol history, high fat diet, sedentary lifestyle. They, they can all be contributory, contributory path in the path pathways. So what are the clues? So I, as I said that while defining the metabolic syndrome that we need uh, high blood pressure, high triglyceride, which is bad fat, uh, weight circum waist circumferences and all those things can be a clue to see if somebody's got metabolic syndrome. And then if, if you notice something like this, then it is good to speak to a medical person to help and see whether that is something which need to be looked into. So, why we should be concerned about metabolic syndrome? Uh, because as we know, it relates to the risk of developing cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, and by, by, may, by means of cardiovascular disease is basically to uh, generate, uh, uh, like tell you about the heart attack and strokes, yeah? So other condition also can be uh, associated with this thing, which can be polycystic ovarian syndrome, which uh, I think uh, one of the common presentation in female when they come uh, to such a bariatric clinic. Fatty liver, which is basically fat deposited in liver as a result of this. Obstructive sleep apnea, asthma, gallstones, and some of some form of cancers and hypertension can all be associated with uh, metabolic syndrome and weight. So coming down to management of metabolic syndrome, as we all know that uh, obesity it causes a lot of metabolic changes inside the body. And similarly, the changes uh, or uh, various factors happening because of the metabolic changes uh, are com closely interrelated to each other. And that's why um, anything which uh, will help to improve the weight will help improve the metabolic syndrome. And that's why the main focus for management of metabolic syndrome is lifestyle behavior changes uh, and the weight management. So as I come back to the treatment of uh, weight management, um, there are namely three uh, modalities which we normally use. One is the lifestyle behavior changes wherein we work upon our um, healthy lifestyle, eating behaviors, uh, physical activity levels. And second aspect uh, which can be dealt with uh, is with the use of medications. As we know, um, we are lucky now uh, in last few uh, years that we have got some good medications or injection therapies which have come up to help with the uh, treatment of uh, weight management or obesity. 
So these are namely uh, GLP-1 analog therapy, and then uh, in next few months, we'll be having some combination therapy as well. But as we all know, and most people will know that uh, we have what we call Saxon and Vigovi, which are the frontline uh, runner in this type of medication. So what we understand is um, lifestyle behavior changes on its own um, might not be significantly or completely effective in dealing with weight who are, uh, in, in individuals who have got uh, significant obesity. And similarly, uh, this new medications which are available um, might, uh, at present, I think uh, what we see is the best uh, case scenario. They might be helping with the weight loss of about 20% uh, in the best case scenario. So we need to wait for some more time to get more uh, definite answers, like how long this uh, weight loss would uh, last from this uh, injection therapy and how much we can achieve with the newer agents which are going to come in near future. So at present, lifestyle changes and medication on their own might not be effective in getting um, uh, weight down or keeping it down for a long period of time and hence, uh, through various researches and studies which we have uh, looked into, bariatric surgery remains one of the best option to achieve lasting weight loss uh, in the long run and to help improve the aspect of metabolic syndrome, namely diabetes and the cardiovascular risk. So why do we call as weight loss surgery a metabolic surgery? Because as we know that uh, the digestive pathway, which is the gastrointestinal tract, including stomach, small bowels, liver, pancreas. They are all involved in the process of metabolism. And we know by achieving uh, weight loss, and similarly, uh, there are different changes which happens with the surgery uh, that helps uh, improving the hormonal profile, lead to weight loss and improved metabolic um, um, uh, outcomes like improvement in diabetes and stroke and heart attack. And that's why these bariatric surgery nowadays are being also or as well called as metabolic surgery or bi metabolic bariatric surgery. So how does this uh, surgery benefit you? So as I said, um, the metabolic effect uh, is basically seen very early after having a bariatric surgery. It can be a few weeks after surgery, even before you have seen the weight loss from the bariatric surgery. And hence we know that there are some pathways which are um, basically stimulated after bariatric surgery, which helps with the improvement in the metabolic parameters, like improvement in your uh, blood pressure, improvement in your uh, cholesterol levels, improvement in, in your blood sugar levels, uh, even before the weight loss has happened. And hence, um, the benefits are generally from weight loss, metabolic effect, and also uh, in turn, it leads to various improvement in the um, uh, inflammatory profile, which and then this time somebody to get uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases like heart attack and stroke. And that's why I think the benefit of bariatric surgery or the metabolic surgery goal is in a long way and it is multifactorial uh, how it benefits somebody. So as I said, like um, bariatric surgery or the metabolic bariatric surgery remains the most effective long-term treatment for weight loss and remission of diabetes. So how does it work? Uh, as I mentioning previously, that uh, it is more than what uh, the bariatric surgery can do is nothing just the impact of the physical changes to the stomach and the small bowel, uh, what we call as a restrictive or the mal substitute defect. It is beyond that, there are changes to the hormonal profile. It helps to uh, modulate various hormones which are involved in satiety and hunger hormones as well. And on, on top of that, there are changes into the bile acid profile and the changes in the bugs or the organisms inside the uh, bowels, uh, which helps with the weight and the weight uh, uh, loss phenomenon. And hence, it is a multifactorial uh, approach with, where this metabolic surgery or the bariatric surgery would help in getting the weight down. So this is basically um, uh, some data from various studies uh, which have been carried across uh, in people with bariatric surgery to see how it try to help with the weight loss irrespective of the uh, with, with the improvement of metabolic parameters irrespective of the weight loss so as you could see there are so many hormones involved uh, which uh, i think i don't want to go into the technicality of it 
But what you have to importantly understand is GLP-1 analog, uh, GLP-1 uh, and GIP are basically, those are satiety hormones, which generally increases after bariatric surgery and helps to uh, have a better profile with reduction in uh, food intake and also um, uh, improvement in the uh, diabetes or glycemic control. And similarly, you can see uh, this, the top slide shows um, the impact of the hormones in somebody who didn't have the metab metabolic or the bariatric surgery. The hormone levels like ghrelin and adid adenopectin and, and insulin and leptin, they're all coming from your pancreas and small bowels and the fat tissues. So they're quite variable. But after, after having bariatric surgery in the second slide, you can see that the ghrelin and the adenopectin, which is coming from the fat tissue, they started they start improving in numbers which generally uh, tells us how the person has uh, done with the weight loss and similarly insulin which is also a growth hormone uh, required for uh, storing energy uh, the level comes down and it improves the insulin resistance and hence and hence there is an improvement in the uh, insulin resistance leading to a metabolic improvement and the uh, impact from the bariatric surgery so this is one more study uh, uh, from the US, uh, which uh, again uh, tells us that how this weight loss surgery gives us a lasting uh, weight loss for many, many years to come. Uh, what they have studied at basically uh, in the first slide, we can see that there's about 400 odd people who had, uh, uh, had weight loss surgery. Uh, this orange uh, dots are basically after two years of uh, data collection, uh, after surgery. The green dots are uh, after six years of uh, surgery and the blue are from 12 years after surgery. So within two years, people have lost almost 35 to 40 percent of the weight and we generally maintain to around 28 percent at six years and 27 percent at the end of 12 year uh, follow up on those uh, um, individuals after bariatric surgery. So this, the middle graph, uh, the, the middle, uh, uh, basically the graph shows what impact uh, people had if they didn't go and uh, if they do, didn't go and have the battery surgery because these two groups were uh, in that program where they were decided, uh, where, where they had like what we call as a tier three program in the US uh, and they were selected to have battery surgery. But because of insurance uh, reasons, this, group of people in the middle graph could not have a surgery and they continued with uh, a conventional approach of diet and exercise and the lifestyle changes. So we can see that their baseline weight has not changed at two years. Uh, at six years also, there's not much change and at definitely at 12 years, there's not significant change. Uh, you can see some uh, hollow dots in between. These are the people who then ended up having some surgery and that's why I think few of them lost more weight than the uh, counterpart uh, who didn't have the surgery in this group. And that's why you can see the dotted line showing the impact of that small change of the people who had uh, weight loss surgery during that period of time. Uh, I don't know whether they spent money to have it uh, somewhere else, but that benefit was then noted in a small group of population in the same group. So the third graph basically shows that people who didn't have a bariatric surgery and who didn't want bariatric surgery at all. And that's why I think their weight generally remained uh, at baseline two years, six years and 12 years. It was all the same throughout the uh, study period. So in a, in a summary, weight loss surgery uh, is a basically a very important tool to help with the weight outcome, weight loss outcome and also the bariatric, uh, sorry, metabolic parameters improvement. And again, some more studies basically because um, uh, it is all what uh, we ought to understand is uh, everything comes from the experiences and the studies which have been carried out uh, 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 to help decide which is the best pathway to achieve improvement in the metabolic uh, parameters and the weight loss in the long run. This is study from a, a Swedish group, a big study about 15 to 20 years. The panel on the left side tells us um, uh, the weight loss with different approaches uh, using um, gastric band, uh, sleep gastrectomy, and the gastric bypass. So the top line is basically people 
who didn't have any uh, uh, surgery. This were their comparative group. So they didn't lose much weight. So they were just uh, stationary at the weight which they started at the initial and at the end of the 15 years. The orange line shows you the weight loss achieved with gastric banding. So it's somewhere around 12 to 15 percent uh, at the end of 15 years. The purple line is basically um, uh, with the sleep gastrectomy. And again, it shows that the maximum weight loss achieved at the end of 15 years was around 20 22%. And the green one is because of the gastric bypass. And here we can see uh, it was around 28%. The right side panel on the uh, slide shows uh, the same uh, set of uh, observation being followed up for 20 years, basically five more years from the previous study from the same group of patient. And we can see that it was uh, the weight loss which happened with uh, gastric bypass, sleep gastrectomy, and to an extent with the uh, band as well, has been maintained for 20 years. And you can see the top line, which is basically the control population where we who didn't have the surgery, didn't have any weight benefit at all with the lifestyle intervention. So what we understand is um, the gastric bypass and sleep gastric definitely uh, provide you with significant uh, weight loss improvement in diabetes parameters and um, other uh, um, metabolic related parameters like hypertension, lipid profile. So these are major studies which were done uh, looking at the outcome of uh, weight and uh, metabolic parameters. Now, the study from the previous uh, uh, Swedish, which I was talking about, uh, they also had a look at how does the metabolic surgery or the weight loss surgery or the battery surgery helps with the mortality? You can see the dark line. Uh, the dark form is basically the people who had battery surgery. And the dotted line is basically uh, the control population, the people who didn't have the surgery. And you can see there's uh, almost um, uh, uh, so four, five, yeah, 10, 15 percent uh, mortality benefit um, within 15, 15, 16 years of having the bariatric surgery. And you can see there is a differentiation of these two worms as early as five years after the surgery. So this implies that bariatric surgery is quite effective in terms of improving the mortality from the weight uh, and the metabolic disturbances it causes. And on the right side, you can see uh, this is basically comparing the uh, cardiovascular events like heart attack and stroke and the fatality associated with that. The left side on this panel is basically, it tells you about the fatal events, which again, you see um, the dark line is basically of the people who have undergone bariatric surgery. Uh, it tells that it improves up to 40, 40% um, uh, better than the people who didn't have the bariatric surgery. So there's 40% benefit there. And similarly on the side, this is basically of the cardiovascular events which have happened um, and again you can see it is almost 70 percent 17 one seven percent benefit um, in those people who had bariatric surgery so these are the few other studies uh, which have looked at what could improve with bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery um, as i've said uh, all these parameters which are um, uh, associated with metabolic condition namely diabetes hypertension obstructive sleep apnea, hyperlipidemia, hyper which is uh, cholesterol issues. These are few of them which generally show that almost 70% or more people will have positive benefit. Um, and this has been consistently um, um, found out in various studies which have been carried out over the last 15, 20 years. So very recently, a, pub, uh, a, a study was published um, in a British Medical Journal, uh, which had a look at various studies performed last 15 years. Uh, these are all big studies which are shown here, uh, which compare the data from people with um, uh, metabolic syndrome or people and, and people with obesity uh, and how they impact uh, various um, uh, health parameters. And this is basically to look at it here. You can see uh, there is improvement in the diabetes control or remission of diabetes after bariatric surgery, which is consistently seen in all the um, uh, studies uh, which have been uh, looked up in, into this um, uh, meta-analysis. 
this again uh, it's a very busy slide but i want you to focus on this um, uh, the last column of it which tells that there is a cardiovascular benefit with all this long term studies carried out uh, with the with the use of bariatric surgery as a modality to treat metabolic syndrome or obesity so on the similar line um, these are the um, outcome data from the same uh, set of uh, various studies which were looked into uh, showing that the microvascular uh, abnormality which is basically like uh, if you have diabetes uh, you can get uh, small vessel changes uh, which can cause retinopathy uh, or uh, foot diseases and kidney problems so they have all improved in people who underwent metabolic surgery or bariatric surgery so when we talk about uh, bariatric surgery two of the very common surgery which we perform uh, uh, and for which we have long term data available which shows positive benefit is sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass and i, I believe most of you would have heard about this uh, so all those studies which were carried out um, uh, in the last 10 15 years um, they were compared to each other uh, with regards to the outcome which uh, whether a sleeve is better or uh, uh, or gastric bypass is better or how they uh, how they would help you to improve the outcome so from the analysis it can be looked at uh, weight loss diabetes lipid pro profile improvement happens more commonly with um, sleeve uh, sorry um, gastric bypass uh, but I, as you would see the weight loss profile is not significantly away from the sleeve gastrectomy as well so these are good surgeries to help with the weight loss but gastric bypass as compared to sleeve is better in individual who has got metabolic syndrome type of picture like especially the diabetes and the cholesterol and the lipid problem so hypertension or high blood pressure uh, quality of life mortal mortality benefit they are equally seen with both the surgery so they are not different to each other in terms if if you want to see if there is uh, if you want to have improvement in your blood pressure mortality benefit and the quality of life coming down to reoperation and admission to hospital because as we know sleeve gastrectomy is slightly less invasive surgery as compared to gastric bypass and hence the uh, the reoperation and readmission to hospital with gastric bypass remain slightly marginally higher as compared to sleeve but again we have to understand what it's going to provide you in terms of benefit and um, in the best best case scenario which surgery would be appropriate need to be done anyway uh, because um, the reoperation risk and that readmission risk to the hospital is quite minimal or quite less as compared to the benefit it could provide the studies have also seen uh, looked into the data for alcohol use disorder and the suicide and it has been noted that there's slightly more um, uh, 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 issues with uh, risk uh, associated with alcohol use and uh, and psychosocial um, uh, disorder uh, in people who have gone under uh, who have undergone bariatric surgery and hence it is important that uh, if somebody comes to the background of previous mental health needs or psychosocial uh, disturbances or mood disorder they need to be uh, uh, seen by the uh, uh, psychology team to help them uh, through the process and provide adequate support when they go through the bariatric surgery but again this is quite marginal risk associated uh, uh, to uh, uh, neglect uh, to undermine the um, long term benefits which the surgery provides so this is the final slide which i am going to show is from our salford hospital uh, experience of people undergoing bariatric surgery with metabolic and non metabolic syndrome and it was carried out from the data which we had from five years of uh, um, previous five years. So if you see the red on the top left corner, this graph, um, it shows the red line is, is the people having bariatric surgery with metabolic syndrome. And the blue line is basically uh, people with uh, bariatric surgery without metabolic syndrome. And we can see that it is after five year data uh, follow up, 
both people with metabolic syndrome and non-metabolic syndrome having bariatric surgery achieved almost similar weight loss. But coming to the second uh, graph here, this is for the people who had diabetes um, and had metabolic, uh, sorry, metabolic surgery or bariatric surgery. The red line is basically people who had metabolic syndrome and the blue line is basically who didn't have metabolic syndrome and hence there was not diabetes in, their, in this group of population. So you can see there was significant improvement of HP1C up to 40, 36% within 12 months of the surgery. And the, the good effect lasted till we had the uh, review till five years. So definitely bariatric surgery remains the best way forward if somebody has got metabolic syndrome and especially type 2 diabetes. This, two, this lower left graph, basically, it is of the lipid profile or the cholesterol profile. This one is for the people um, who had, again, the red line is for people with metabolic syndrome. Um, and this is regarding the bad lipid, which is uh, uh, non-HDL cholesterol, which is combination of all the bad lipids in the body. Again, uh, people with metabolic syndrome uh, and non-metabolic syndrome almost achieved a similar uh, profile at the end of five years. And this is again a um, uh, graph of the lipid profile, but it is of a good cholesterol, which is HDL cholesterol. Again, generally, it is um, equally effective uh, in getting the HDL cholesterol better uh, after having bariatric surgery in both metabolic and non metabolic patient cohort. And the last one is basically the blood pressure improvement, uh, and it is equal in both the group of metabolic and non metabolic. So, Definitely a significant benefit from our cohort in diabetes people, people uh, in people with diabetes uh, and the weight loss and other parameters like blood pressure and lipid profile has generally been equally in a, uh, effective uh, 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 in metabolic and non-metabolic group. So I think I can take some questions now. I know there are some questions already been asked. Uh, thanks, Raj. That was a really excellent presentation. And, and um, you are true scientists and bringing us all that data together and making sense of it for us. <laughs> it's greatly appreciated. It's a difficult I'm topic, but I, I'm not sure how much uh, people would have carried, but I think it's a difficult topic to cover everything in 15, 20 minutes. But I tried whatever I could, but I'm happy to take more questions uh, to explain in more detail if somebody has got some more. Yeah. So question wise. Let me to have a look through the Q and A. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or can you see it, Raj? Yeah, I'm having a look at it. Uh, uh, is sleeve bypass available as an option on NHS? And what is the pros and cons? Uh, so this is uh, from one of the question. Yeah, sleeve sleeve and gastric bypass. It says uh, sleeve and bypass. So sleeve and gastric bypass both are. Uh, so surgeries for bariatric need available through NHS and through definitely Salford. And the pros and cons basically, uh, as I've, I've explained that um, uh, in terms of benefit, uh, it is all uh, improving the metabolic parameters like diabetes, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol problem, which in long run helps you improve your cardiovascular risk like uh, risk of heart attack, stroke, um, uh, and also in the law, in the grand scheme of scale, the mortality benefit which, which it, it brings basically, apart from the weight loss and the positive benefit from having just the weight loss. Um, uh, I've briefly discussed about the uh, cons as well, uh, which is um, uh, the immediate surgery and pre-surgical risk associated. But what we have to understand is, uh, Whenever we have a bariatric surgery, uh, tier 4 um, uh, assessment of an individual before bariatric surgery, we look into all the medical details, uh, the per, per patient choices, and also about um, uh, which surgery would be beneficial uh, in terms of risk, risk and benefit, uh, uh, including uh, when we look at their uh, overall um, uh, 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 anesthetic and surgical risk. So in most people with... Um, uh, metabolic syndrome or those who have got diabetes, high blood pressure or cholesterol problem, we would prefer them to undergo gastric bypass as a preferred option unless there are risk associated 
to undergo such um, a slightly more complex surgery as compared to the sleeve. And generally, it's a discussion between uh, the individual, the bariatric physician, uh, the surgeon, and the, uh, and the team of uh, dietetic team and other team which are sitting in the MDG when you come for the tier four uh, uh, assessment. Uh, and and then we can have more detail about how we uh, carry and carry them through, uh, depending upon what is required. So other question is. So, I saw a few questions um because mm -hmm. you mentioned about GLP ones um I saw a few questions about asking if medication is an option before bariatric surgery once someone has been referred. So once um as we know that we are lucky now um we've got some good new lines of uh, injection therapies or medication coming through to help with the weight loss, uh, especially this uh, GLP-1 therapy like Satsenda and Ozempic, uh, sorry, not, not a Vigo V, um, they have shown um, uh, good response in terms of getting weight down up to 6, 20% uh, in most, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the cohort of our patient, which we have seen. But we don't know how long this weight loss will last. Only long-term study from now onwards will let us know whether the weight loss is um, going to persist even if we, we stop the medication after after two years of use, which is now been made uh, mandatory from the NHS uh, or the NICE guidance that it is for two years of use at present. As compared to bariatric surgery, as I've shown some of the studies, the effect of bariatric surgery can last up to 12 to 15 to 20 years as well. But we don't know with this newer medication whether we can have the persistent of effect for such a long period of time or whether we need to just keep continuing using this medication to achieve the benefit. So at present, I would say uh, they're good addition to um, the uh, 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 basically what we have in terms of providing with the weight loss, but long-term weight remission, uh, weight loss remission uh, needs to be seen. And hence, I think still bariatric surgery would be the way forward in terms of achieving the good results, both from weight perspective and metabolic needs. Thank you. So there's one question from Rachel Luz. If somebody has pernicious anemia, which surgery would be best? So again, uh, as I said, like uh, each and every medical condition would be reviewed um, in the TFO bariatric clinic. And at present, I'm not sure if pernicious anemia would be contraindication to any of the surgery available like gastric bypass or sleeve. Uh, but it all depends. Are there any, any other metabolic risk or any other surgical risk or anesthetic risk which they have at the time? Um, but I don't think pernicious anemia as such uh, should be a, a major contraindication to uh, either of the surgery. So next one is uh, my understanding about not being able to take ibuprofen after surgery. Would I stop taking it before surgery? So ibuprofen is basically um, what we call as a non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory medications for pain, which generally causes a lot of acid production in the stomach. And especially um, after having bariatric surgery, uh, which basically makes uh, uh, the scarring, uh, there's a suture inside and scarring in inside. So having an environment of high acid input output would cause uh, difficulty with the sutures and uh, other uh, leading to other complications like uh, opening of the um, um, uh, operative areas. And that's why all this um, stronger uh, anti-inflammatory painkillers are uh, avoided. And you can take it before surgery, but I think after surgery, it won't be a good option. What is the waiting list for NHS surgery? Uh, I think Jody will be in a better position to answer this, but I would say uh, after being seen in the uh, tier four battery clinic in Salford, it is somewhere around 
uh, 50, 40 to 50 weeks, isn't it, Jodi? Or is, is it better Yeah, so, so, it's, so when you come to meet the team, there's a, um, you'll be sent an email with education information and a QA and a um, where we can give you a bit better idea around that. It's difficult with Salford. There's such limited capacity for surgery at Salford, but for, some, uh, for many reasons, you may need to have your surgery at Salford. And unfortunately, that is a longer waiting time. But where possible, we'll cut our waiting list down. Um, for people to go over to the Oaklands Hospital, which is our private provider across the road, um, and that they don't have the same pressures as our uh, larger hospital. Um, there are surgeons, and it's definitely our team will, will do all your follow up and so on. Um, so um, the waiting times there are less. Uh, but once you meet the team, there are uh, things that need to be done as well, such as a sleep study, looking for obstructive sleep apnea um, and psychology. But I go through all of this with you in the Q&As when you come to meet us. I'm just conscious of time and I don't want to keep Dr. Medallia too long. And then we do have another um, short presentation from a, a health innovation group that wanted to talk to you as well this evening, um, just for a, a small moment. Okay. So I think if we've got any other questions around metabolic surgery, Surgery. Uh, well, not around metabolic surgery, but around metabolic syndrome and surgery. Um, let's just see if there's anything else that's worth having trying to answer now. I know there's a lot of people that have come up with various conditions that they have, things like AF or hypotension. Um, and and for, the, for the majority of people, we will proceed with surgery. Um, and that is the vast majority, but we always want to make sure it's safe. So if you have other conditions, we'll want to try and optimize those um, prior to surgery. And um, Maybe you could talk a little bit more about type 2 diabetes and the control of that before surgery, as well as the hopeful remission after surgery. So when they come and meet you, we um, hope that if anyone has type 2 diabetes already to be safe with surgery, to be able to heal as well as we want you to. Um, it's good to not have a really high blood glucose. Um, so a HbA1c, which is the test for diabetes, uh, that that the reading would need to be 75 or below um for us to safely proceed with surgery so that's something to be really aware of especially when you're going through your weight management journey um with your tier three services right now and if you have type 2 diabetes and you know it's quite uncontrolled um that that's something that you you really need to address before coming to meet our team so there's not any nasty surprises or delays when you have your hba1c test with us yeah Thank you. Um, just final question. If someone is suspecting that they need support with um, metabolic syndrome, would, would their GP be able to support them? Yeah, I think if somebody suspecting that they've got um, uh, a different combination of uh, what I've explained as a metabolic syndrome, and they can very well speak to the GP to help but if they're already uh, into the system and we know that um, uh, weight loss uh, is is a sort of a treatment for metabolic syndrome and hence the lifestyle changes should happen and if the, there's a there's a consideration for weight loss surgery that that should be uh, that should be on the card anyway but it is always important to understand if uh, the risk associated with high blood pressure cholesterol problems risk of diabetes or diabetes itself and trunkal obesity or uh, increased uh, waist size, then they should at least, uh, instead of um, uh, getting help from the, uh, waiting for the help for, from the um, uh, medical people, they should start um, on the lifestyle behavior changes like diet, exercise, because we know this, all this measure goes a long way to help improve those conditions. Thank you. Jodie, what would you like to do? Would you like to continue any more questions or would you like to? Let's see what time we're on now. Yeah, no, I think um, I think what we'll do now is just um, go to our uh, team that have joined us from Manchester Health Innovation. So they're really interested in your weight loss journeys um, and looking at future initiatives. So they've got a brief um, talk for you this evening. So we'll hand over to Stuart and Catherine. Thanks, Raj. You're welcome to stay or, or you, you may go, <laughs> whatever you prefer.
<laughs> um, my name's uh, Stuart Cale. Uh, I'm a, a program development lead at Health Innovation Manchester, and uh, I'm with Catherine uh, Booth, who's my colleague, who's project support officer. And we both work on a program uh, that we call in understanding and reimagining um, obesity care pathways in Greater Manchester. Uh, so, what Health Innovation Manchester does is um, we, we're a, a health, uh, a, an academic health science and innovation system. <clears throat> and, and basically, we work with innovators uh, to discover and develop and deploy new solutions that improve health and wellbeing uh, of Greater Manchester's 2.8 uh, million people. Um, so, that's a, a, a a wide range of projects and uh, we often will partner with um, commercial and industry uh, partners um, to fund really uh, exciting projects um, to help us learn about what, what needs to be in place, what needs to be wrapped around uh, these new and exciting innovations that are always coming into the NHS to help them really land as quickly as possible. So what we've come to talk to you guys about today is um, we've been working uh, with Lily UK on a project uh, to uh, help help Greater Manchester system understand current pathway uh, for adults wanting to get support if they're struggling uh, with their weight. Uh, we've been doing that for over a year now. We're, we're pulling the results together just now and <clears throat> they're going to be really, really helpful Um in helping, uh, you know, influential people, I suppose, within Greater Manchester um, to, to make important decisions about um, how to invest, I suppose, in, um, in, in weight management services uh, going forward. So um, we've done a bit of uh, path um, pathway mapping and we've done some modeling of the costs um, of the current pathways uh, that patients might take when they're getting support for their weight and our ask of of you guys of this group is we're here to ask you to let us know if you'd like to talk to us uh, about your own lived experience of accessing support um, for for your weight in greater manchester so um i, I noticed in the the q a that you know there's quite a lot of uh, questions and comments coming through alluding to the, the length of time that, that people are waiting so we know that we've got uh, an audience here that's got some real long-term experience of <clears throat> what it's like to um, to try and get help uh, with, with managing your weight um, over long periods of time and so there's an opportunity here um, to really have your voice heard and we, we've done lots of work so far with um, providers of, of weight management services, with commissioners, um, with academics, with experts. And we're just conscious that we've got a bit of a gap here uh, around the service user's voice. And, we're, and we, we know how important that is. And we're really, really keen um, to, to capture your experiences and ensure that it's fed into this work. So we are interested in he hearing about how you, you began your journey, um, how you found your experiences of, of trying to access support, uh, <clears throat> thinking about the language that healthcare professionals use when discussing weight support, things like the, the choices that you have um, that you've been given throughout your journey. Um, there's an opportunity here as well for you to, to potentially inform and influence improvements uh, in the way that weight management services are designed and delivered in Greater Manchester. And there's an opportunity for you to be part of an important piece of work that um, it isn't just going to stop this year. It's it's going to grow legs and it's, it, it's going to continue. So we're really keen to start to build a network of um, of service users um, that, that we can consult with and refer to um, to help really sort of balance out um, <clears throat> that, that that voice. Um, so Catherine, I'm going to swap, uh, hand over to Catherine in a minute, and Catherine's going to give you the details um, for a couple of options to join 
join the focus group. In the next uh, two or three weeks, uh, we're extremely keen to get as many of you guys uh, involved in that. Um, it wouldn't be a huge ask on your time, uh, and we are able to offer reimbursement uh, for your time. And that hopefully, I've kind of made you made the point here that um, your views would really add some significant value um, to this project as we bring this phase to a close. So I'll just I'll hand over to Catherine. Catherine's going to give you the details um, of the uh, of the two uh focus groups that we've got coming up yeah thanks Stuart um yeah so like Stuart said obviously we'd really like to hear your opinions and your voice on your weight management journeys so we're gonna host two focus groups um one online so similar to zoom but we'll likely use microsoft teams um that anybody in the manchester area um so greater manchester we're looking Four, um, and one in person at our offices at Health Innovation Manchester. So our office is based at City Labs number one, and that's at the Royal Manchester, the Manchester Royal Infirmary. Um, it's just opposite the car park, so really accessible for you. There's a bus stop right outside as well. Um, and the groups will take part um, on a Wednesday at six o'clock. Um, and on the 21st of February is likely to be our um, online session and the week after the 28th of February is likely to be our in-person session um, and if you'd like to get involved I have sent over my details to Abby so she'll send across uh, my email address a little form that we've got for you to sign up through um, and if you'd just like to chat and get a little bit more information um, you can also drop me an email about that and we're looking to have about 20 people at each group um, we can be a little bit flexible in that we'll, you know, we'll take less people if, if not a lot of people sign up. Um, but we really, really like um, to give you all the opportunity to have your voice heard in just a slightly different way and help to just inform our project and the wider Greater Manchester system on weight management services. Yeah, so thank you. That's everything from me. And um, hopefully you'll get our details sent round to you so that you're able um to get in touch with us and start sign up if you'd like to right thanks again for that Stuart and Catherine we'll be really interested in the results so we'll be definitely having you back to see what kind of information you found out from people that are very experienced in the world of managing weight and and what's available and what's not available um I, there was a few questions about what happens um, once you've been through tier three weight management? So the weight management team that you're sat with at the minute, I know quite a few people are going, oh, what can my GP do about my metabolic uh, syndrome or if I have metabolic syndrome? For most people, your GP has already acted. They've already acted by referring you to a weight management service. Um, and, by, and when you're in a weight management service, that should allow you to have any available um, medical or um, if it's something you wish to have, which is why a lot of people come to these sessions um, a surgical intervention to help with that so once you've completed your program with your weight management team um, and they have said that they feel that you are suitable for bariatric surgery so you may have done some of their psychology or um, uh, 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 group work with them you'll have definitely done lots of lifestyle interventions which I'm sure lots of you feel like I know about these things and, and and all the kinds of things that you know we're not trying to catch anyone out we just want to make sure that everybody's really prepared because when you looked at those graphs that um, Raj was showing us before with a sleeve gastrectomy with a bypass everybody loses weight everybody might get a little bit of weight regain and then they tend to maintain and and um, uh, to have that long-term maintenance you need to have all those knowledge and skills that you're hopefully un um, learning and understanding for your time in weight management um when you're referred over to us we have got our waiting times down um sadly before christmas i think it was around 67 weeks but they've been overworking as i'm sure uh, raj will attest they just double the numbers and we're all there for the long haul so we're very sorry if when you come to meet us um over at salford and it can seem a bit hectic in those waiting rooms and people are there for hours and um, that's because we are trying to get that waiting time down and it's down to under 50 weeks now so um that's promising um, and obviously we're going to strive to keep making that better. 
Um, I know quite a few people were saying things like, could I have a balloon? Could I have um, a, a gastric band? Um, any consideration of surgery is done when you meet our team. And the only surgeries we offer are the um, bypass, for which there are two types, the single anastomosis and the ruin Y gastric bypass. And um, when our surgeons do a talk, um, and I think we have got um, uh, Mr. Alkafaf coming and um, speak to us in the session after next. And we've got some recordings of previous surgeons that have spoken. They will talk a bit more about those different surgeries that we offer. We do not offer gastric balloons anymore. Uh, we take out a lot of gastric balloons. I'm sure there are many people out there who have had good weight loss with balloons, but I'm afraid we see every all of them that are problematic. And a lot of our emergency work, um, a lot of the reasons that are uh lists are taking up um is going to be with where um surgeries go wrong um you know again with bariatric tourism we see a lot more of that in our main hospital now um and taking out gastric bands um so they're not really deemed as a really great solution certainly not for metabolic syndrome um so the gastric band is not something we offer Gastric balloons are interesting short term. They can help somebody who ha perhaps has a BMI of maybe 70 plus. So that's our super, super, super obese category. Um, if we are going to struggle to get our laparoscopes in and cannot physically do your surgery, we need to help you with a, uh, as much weight loss as possible so we can get you into a theatre table. And that's the kind of extremes when um, we as a weight management service are able to use um, things such as gastric balloons and on the rare occasions, um, uh, the GLP-1 injections. Um, I know that this, the GLP-1 injections are very exciting and very pr um, progressive um, in terms of weight management, but they're still not there. They're still not widely available, sadly. Um, so this isn't something that we can offer people um, all the time in the interim. Um, I know at one point we were trying to do this. I know that weight management services are trying to offer these as well, um, but we're just not there yet. So even though it's exciting, unfortunately, it's not something that we can um, offer you while you're waiting for your surgery. Uh, so I hope that's answered a few of the questions that are, were in there around surgeries and waiting times and meeting our team. Um, someone else was asking about four slot. A lot of people use this term, like we call, call things tier three weight management, tier four weight uh, uh, services, which is basically bariatric surgery. There's a lot of terminology. So just deciphering that a weight management um, uh, service is the only service that can refer you on for bariatric surgery. And that is what we call the tier four. So tier three is the weight management, which you're all in at the moment. And tier four is the bariatric service where we can offer bariatric surgeries. Um, and then um, four in one, that's an old term really for when you come and meet us. So when you've waited that 50 weeks or hopefully getting less um, to come and meet us, when you come and meet us, that's what some people refer to as a four in one. It just means that you're having your bloods taken, you're probably gonna meet a medic, you're definitely gonna meet a surgeon um, and you're gonna have more small, much smaller, more intimate one or uh, uh, Q&A sessions with, with me, me and my colleague Chris, who's the dietitian. Um, I've just, yeah, just seen something else someone was saying. Um, the talk tonight, as you've probably noticed, is recorded. So those recordings all get put into the chat. They also also get put into the um, closed Facebook so, uh, group. So someone else was asking about Facebook groups. So Abby's great. She'll be putting all these links into the, um, is it the chat? Is the chat open now? I know we disable it while people are talking uh, when the presenters are on, just because otherwise it can get a bit noisy and people get distracted and they don't necessarily listen to what's being uh, presented. Um, so so um, on the closed Facebook Book group, all the kind of archive of our of our sessions are there as well. If there's any that people are particularly interested in, yeah, I've just put the link for the Facebook into the chat, and um, it's a private closed Facebook group. Um, we don't we monitor it um to make sure that all is okay on that group, um, but it's it's mainly you guys that run that group sharing stories and ideas and tips and advice. So it's a good one to join. Um, and then I'll share the YouTube channel as well, where all of these webinars get uploaded to. Yeah. Okay, that's brilliant. So when Abby says we, she means ABL, which is the yeah. one of the weight management services that kindly facilitate this very large um, uh, group for us um so um all the professionals at salford we're not involved in those facebook groups 
I'm also able to share my screen now just with the um, QR code for that um, project that's due it um, and Catherine oh, were talking about. That'd be fantastic. So I'll just quickly Thank share you. my screen for a few moments so that people can have a quick read over and scan ah, the QR code on a phone. Brilliant. Perfect. Thanks, Ali. Perfect. Okay, so is there any more questions you think we should answer, Abby? I know there can be a lot. We try and keep it to the topic of, of the speakers we've had. So don't worry if any of your questions don't get answered. They're probably going to get answered in a session that's more around that topic. Um, no, I think you've covered um, the main ones. Yeah, there was a few questions around people that have had surgery. If you were more like kind of asking the wider group in case there's any kind of post-op patients on there, we do have a post-op support group. Um, that runs simultaneously. Um, it's not every, it's, a, it's the uh, first Wednesday of every other month face to face at the Mayo building. Um, so any of the healthcare professionals that you've met along the way, we write to you. So our numbers, email num email addresses are all in the top right hand corner of any clinic letters that you've had. And if you've um, had the uh, had surgery or had the education email, um, you'll have my number and, and Chris's number as well for the dietitian. Um, so if any of you are interested in, in coming who've had surgery, come along to that post-op support group. Some of you in there had a few health concerns for after surgery. Um, so again, you know, Know, do get in touch with us if there's anything you want to query there's no daft questions so please do get in touch with us if you're concerned that something's not quite right or you've just got a general question that's fine we're still here to support you I've just seen um, a couple there a couple of questions around mental health support at Salford Royal say if someone um, has anxiety or a past eating disorder or um, any mental health challenges um, what yeah, is I think I think you know. I think absolutely. I think um, mental health is so important, and and I think with um, uh, obesity and and many health conditions out there, um, it's never just a, a surgical in, intervention. Um, however, the 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 very stark truth of it all is that Salford when you come to meet us can offer you a psychological assessment which about 90 percent of patients will uh, of people that meet us will have and um, that's about an hour and a half session it looks at where you were where you are now where you want to be and um, it's not there to catch you out it's trying to think about you having that self-awareness about that kind of mental toolkit as life goes on because it's never just one thing at a time that we as humans have to deal with um, however, if you have an eating disorder um, or uh, you kind of have a or maybe kind of uncontrolled comfort eating, um, if there's anything like that, bariatric surgery will never help you, I'm afraid. Um, so if people have eating disorders, they need to be dealt with during this time. It needs to be found out during your time with weight management because um, it's sad if, if, if you know, if, if after surgery, mentally you weren't ready for it there's always a way around it if you want to overeat in some way or another um so these things are really important and are very separate from bariatric surgery so we hope that when you have your time and weight management and you're very candid and you're going through this process those things are dealt with before you're even referred for surgery we get the opportunity to meet you on one occasion we may meet you a few times after that maybe for that psychology assessment maybe for your sleep study test and that noticing the questions it says if you have obstructive sleep apnea no you do not need to go if you're established on CPAP you need to bring that on the day of surgery but I will talk to you more about that one um so yeah so coming back to kind of psychology that psychology assessment is really important and we do have capacity albeit again with a ridiculously long wait to give people some therapy before bariatric surgery and that can be really important um but as I say ideally all of those kind of things will have been dealt with before you're even referred on to a service like us. After surgery, where there have been patients that have had real concerns with their mental health, again, that can be very difficult. I can refer back to our psychologist, but if it's picking up on an eating disorder, they will then want you to go to an eating disorder psychologist in your community. Um, if it's picking up on anxiety or things that you had before, more generalised anxiety, then they again will want you to go to the to the mental health services there. So so it's it's still very nuanced to which kind of service can help you. Is it a, a service in your community? Is it the, the, the psychology team that sit with our weight management? Um, so yeah, so I think really the big take home message from this is that 
all things are body and mind um, and we can only help you with that physiological tool mental health services are ridiculously stretched and, and often inadequate frankly um, so it can be really difficult to access the kind of help you need so being aware at this stage while you're with tier three weight management services that have access to psychology to help you with these things or know exactly the kind of eating disorders that you're talking about and can refer you into those in a timely way so that you're not coming to the end of the program and then realizing you're having these problems or worse still never ever discussing them and then struggling after surgery thank you um we also have holly here tonight jodie's um to do a short presentation on the is it a research project holly yeah i mean ultimately it's just to make people aware because i appreciate it. it's late and everyone wants to go but um just before you start sorry i'm just gonna because just in case a few people do start logging off, um, I just wanted to let people know I've put in the chat the Facebook group um, that Jodie mentioned and the YouTube channel um, for the recordings of these sessions. They go up on there. I've also put the feedback survey in, so if anyone ever has any feedback from these sessions, we really appreciate if you took a couple of minutes to fill in that feedback, feedback survey so we can continue adapting it to your needs and to make sure we are getting the right information to you. And I'll let you go, Holly. Thanks, Abby. So um, myself or the team at Salford might be approaching you in the coming um, months to see if you'd be interested in taking part in a, an exciting study. Um, it's an international study that's trying to understand why people with obesity are more at risk of developing certain types of cancer. And uh, the study involves taking some samples from you before you have your bariatric surgery and then 12 months afterwards. Um, there's quite a few samples and quite a few questionnaires that you'll have to, um, that you would have to agree to. Um, samples include um, some swabs in the mouth, a mouthwash sample, some blood tests, urine tests. And then we're looking for um, people specifically who have a uterus and who have breast tissue because we need a breast biopsy, we need a biopsy from the lining of the womb, and we also need a biopsy from the bowel, from the colon. Um, because obviously this is a large number of samples and because um, we understand that this will take time, we are offering um, quite a significant reimbursement for this, um, which will equal over the um, two sets of samples that people have taken at approximately 500 pounds. Um, if anybody is interested in taking part and would like some more information, our email address is prominent at manchester.ac.uk and I'll put that in the chat and ask Abby to pop it over to you. But equally, just to let you know, we will be approaching people um, either over the phone or um, we'll be approaching people at, at these groups and, and seeing if anybody is interested as well. Um, it's a really exciting study, as I say, um, although international, I'm afraid it doesn't involve any international travel, but uh, it does mean you get a trip to um, to St. Mary's and to, and to Withenshaw. So I hope to um, see you all next um, next month and tell you a little bit more about it. But I appreciate it. Two minutes to eight. It's time, time for, not quite time for bed, but almost time to go. So thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Holly. It's a really, really important study. Obviously, we're, we're always grateful to anybody who wants to partake in these things. Um, so we'll definitely have you back so you can tell us a bit more about it and, and keep spreading the word for, for this cause. It's really, really important. So thank you. OK, then, everyone, I'm sorry that we had the technical issue at the beginning of the session. Um, and thank you so much to Dr. Medallia, our speaker this evening. Um, those slides, I'm definitely going to be watching again <laughs> on the recording because they were really in depth. And it was really a, a pleasure to, to have uh, to hear a bit more about why obesity is, is such an issue and, and, and why you're all here this evening thinking about the things that can help going forward. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all your questions. Um, and we will see you uh, next month. Yeah, the next one is on the 6th of March. Do we have a topic for that one yet? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. <laughs> Fine, okay, okay. It'll so go on I've, the Facebook yeah. group when we do. Brilliant. All right. That's great. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.